one. She is back on this podcast. Her name is Catherine Lumas. She was here to talk about Hannibal the last time, which is an episode I really highly recommend checking out. And what are we going to talk about today? Okay. Uh, well, what I wanted to talk, what I would like to talk about today is the Etruscans. And who were they? Exactly. Um, well, they, they were one of the ancient peoples of Italy um, before the Romans. Um, ancient Italy was a, was, very multi, was a very multicultural area of the world, and there were lots of different ethnic groups. Uh, the Etruscans were the, basically the ones that lived roughly between the north bank of the Tiber, so just north of Rome, uh, up to the area around, around about modern Florence, or slightly north of that. Uh, so they're near, near neighbours of the Romans. Um, but their early development was even more spectacular than that of Rome. Um, so basically, we're talking about the peoples who occupied the, that particular area uh, roughly between the 8th century BC and the beginning of the Roman Empire. Um, and they were fascinating because um, they are pretty much the economic and social and cultural powerhouse of ancient Italy in the, in the period before the Romans started expanding seriously in the 4th century BC. And in fact, I think one of the interesting questions were, is, you know, why, why, why did Rome become the leading power of Italy and not, the, not one of the Etruscan cities? Um, the other thing is that they're very central to a lot of other Italian culture. They very, 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 very uh, had, had a very wide ranging impact and particularly on, on Rome itself. So if, if you've got a, say a Roman asking the sort of life of Brian question of what did the Etruscans yeah. ever do for us, you get really quite an extensive answer that, you know, a lot of their religious practices, the technical skills, things like gladiatorial games, even act yeah. items addressed like the toga had an Etruscan origin. So the, the, it's very difficult to understand the development of Rome, and particularly early Rome, without without sort of engaging with the Etruscans. And I, I was watching to to research for this episode, and we actually do have, I believe, it date of the alphabet from the Greeks, not the Romans from the Greeks, but we have the modern alphabet of Charles yeah. the Etruscans as well. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they they were the people who introduced writing into Italy. Uh, which they developed from probably the Phoenician alphabet with some Greek influence, and then that developed through to a series of other alphabets, which which ultimately went to the Roman alphabet and then down to us. So they 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 a lot a lot of, a lot of what we associate with Rome, uh, like you know the introduction of writing, certain technical skills, you know things like gladiatorial games, um, wearing the toga. They, a lot a lot of these are all sort of Etruscan in origin, or at least have some sort of Etruscan influence. Um, so they're not only fascinating themselves, but they're also really important for how the rest of Italy develops and, and particularly for how Rome develops. And I think it's important to think about, start from the very beginning and ask, where did they come from? Was, was, was this an Indo-European tribe? Did they come from the Indo-Europeans or did they, where did they come from? Um, well, this is a million dollar question, and it basically has been since the, the, the fifth century BC, uh, because there are two, there, there are two, um, contrasting strands in, in ancient history about this. Uh, and then also you've got to add in the, the linguistic and archeological evidence uh, because Herodotus, the Greek historian says that they were immigrants from Lydia, what's now Turkey, who'd come, come to Italy to escape famine. Uh, whereas Dionysius of Halicarnassus who's also Greek and, and from you know, Greek Turkey himself uh, said that they were native to Italy. So, you, you know, as far, as far back as the ancient world you've got two divergent traditions. One that says they were indigenous and one that said they were immigrants. Um, and the difficulty here is that uh, we have some aspects of Etruscan religion and, of course, the language, which is deeply mysterious and difficult, uh, which are very different from anything else that happens in Italy. Uh, but at the same time, the archaeological evidence all says that there is continuity of occupation during you know, the period when the Etruscan culture is really forming for the first time. Did they come before the Romans or did they come during the same time? Um, well, archaeologically, the development of uh, the, the earliest development of the Etruscan city-states really really is contemporary with the earliest developments on the site of Rome and there's no sign of any mass migration at that stage. Um, one or two people have tried some DNA studies and what that suggests was that there is some connection between the ancient population of the area and central Turkey uh, but they're not conclusive and the problem is that... Why are, why are what they it, conclusive? Sorry? What, what makes you so that they aren't conclusive? Um, well, the, set, the, set, the, set, the uh, human remains don't survive very well in the region, so uh, the, the, um, the, the evidence isn't, isn't, isn't that robust. Um, but the problem really is not so much 
where the people came from, but when they came, because there's absolutely no evidence of a migration in the period immediately before what we think of as Etruscan art, culture archaeologically starts developing. Uh, so if there was a mi migration, it must have been an awful lot earlier than the Iron Age. Um, and I, I mean, what I think possibly might have happened is that maybe peoples from the Middle East got, got, to, got to that part of Italy in sort of much earlier prehistory, and that maybe Herodotus's um, story about the King of Lydia and his sons and the migration might have been a sort of very early folk memory. Um, but what happens archaeologically is that it's not really, the Etruscan civilization doesn't, the culture doesn't really emerge out of, uh, out, out of a sort of newly arrived population of migrants. It arrives, uh, it, it arrives out of what was there already. Uh, because what we have is, is an Iron Age culture, known as the Villanovan culture, uh, which seems to be sort of getting richer and, and more complex at, the, at this period of time. So you get you get their, their settlements are getting bigger and they're becoming more complicated um, and moving away from being just villagers to you know being something that's getting to look more urban. Uh, burials are getting richer. Uh, the circle social hierarchy seems to be getting steeper because some bur burials are markedly richer. So you get you're getting a, a, a sort of perhaps a, a sort of chieftain class emerging, and you're also getting more goods coming in from Greece and, and the Near East. Uh, so clearly there are quite big social and economic changes going on, but there's no sign that they were being driven by a sort of migration from outside. They seem to be being driven from within the society itself. Um, so in, in a sense, if the Etruscans came from somewhere else, they came, you know, a lot longer before what we call the Etruscan civilization really so developed. There, so there is a chance that they were in the European. Right? Yeah, yeah, I think, I think the, I think the, 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 the um, I think, I, think the, I think the problem is that there's probably, probably a long history of long-term migration all over the Mediterranean and maybe it may be beyond that into Central Europe, um, which we don't really have records of. Um, and, and as I say, there's been some work on DNA being done, but the, the, because we don't have a great deal of human remains surviving um, from, from the region, you know, it's not, it's, not, it's, it's not an area where the subsoil preserves a lot of human remains. Um, and for for a large amount of the time, the the Etruscan culture was was actually cremating culture, so you don't get bodies surviving um, that can be worked on. So it's it, it's it's um, it's a fascinating strand of research, but it's something that's still that's still still not 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 uh, really sort of thrown up any conclusive right. evidence. Um, I I remember what, when again when I was researching. Yes, I was watching that the Greeks didn't view the Etruscans very highly. Why was this? Sorry? That the Greeks themselves didn't view the Etruscans very highly. So why? Yeah, the Greek. I mean, the Greeks uh, had quite close connections with the Etruscans uh, from really quite an early date. Um, I mean, what, one thing that seems to have driven um, a big part of the development of the of Etruscan culture was that they were sitting on one end of a trade route which spanned the whole of the Mediterranean and, and sort of linked Greece and the Greek world to um, the Near East on one end and, and the Western Mediterranean on the other. Um, and uh, so the Greeks had, you know, close connections with with the Etruria, with the Etruria going going really quite back into the probably at least the seventh century BC, if not earlier. So they they, they were quite familiar with the Etruscans. Um, and one thing that seems to come through with a lot of stories about the um, development of the Etruscans in the um, in the early phase of their development is is the fact that they have these these these, these close connections with the Greek with the Greek world, um, and most of them seem to be built on trade, but some of them seem to be built on on personal connections with uh, local uh, you know leading aristocrats. Um, but the Etruscans, clearly, the, the Greeks are clearly, clearly interested in the Etruscans because historians like Herodotus talk about the Etruscans quite a lot. Mm -hmm. um, the Greeks do have a sort of slightly ambivalent attitude uh, to them. I and mean, one, one, thing, one thing the Etruscans had was a reputation for piracy. Um, you know, a lot of Greek historians say, well, they, they're, they're terribly fierce and they're pirates and therefore we can't go and settle there because, you know, they'll come and raid us. But again, that 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 may be a sort of flip side of, you know, 
one person's pirate is another person robustly defending their territorial waters. So, you know, I, I think, you know, you've got to got to allow for, for sort of Greek, um, uh, you know, Greek bias in that respect. Um, but also uh, the Etrus Etruscan and Greek culture are very closely interlinked because the Greeks exported an awful lot of objects to uh, Etruria. Um, we have a lot of evidence of Greeks actually living in, Etr in Etruria who were probably merchants or craftsmen. Um, and I, I think one thing that sort of... Sorry. Yeah. I think one... What, 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 I think one thing that, that actually, actually sort of um, sums it up quite nicely is a story which is, actually is in Herodotus, where he talks about um, a, a very wealthy Corinthian aristocrat called Demaratus, mm. uh, who is uh, an aristocrat from the ruling dynasty, and then he gets flung out into political exile. Um, and what Herodotus says is that because he's made most of his money from trading with Etruria, uh, he has lots of contacts and lots of friends in Tarquinia, which is one of the leading cities of Etruria. Uh, so he simply migrates there because he's got all these connections there. Um, and he takes with him a whole string of Greek craftsmen who introduce new skills in terms of pottery, metalworking, literacy and various other things. Um, uh, and then settles down and, and basically becomes a leading citizen of Tarquinia. Um, and then subsequently, his son goes, migrates to Rome and becomes the, the, the fifth king of Rome. So it gives you quite a strong idea of both the close connections between the sort of Greek and Etruscan worlds and, and, and also the fact that Herodotus has basically created this story in which rationalizes all these Greek craftsmen who were migrating to Etruria. Now, something I want to ask about before we go really into this, that, that from, because looking at some Etruscan homes and photographs of what they may have looked like, they seem rather prim primitive compared to ancient Greece and Romans. But is this true that they primitive at all, or do they, what are more complicated than you think, the, the society of and No, it's, of it's actually Etruscan. very sophisticated. It's actually a very sophisticated society. And I think one of the things that I think is perhaps important is that the ancient Mediterraneans are very sort of inter interconnected world at this stage, uh, because one of the things that's very central to the, the formation of the Etruscan culture is a phenomenon which is often called, often termed the Orientalizing Revolution, uh, which affects basically the whole Mediterranean, and it's named after, after, after the dominant artistic style. Um, but what's happening in pretty much everywhere, and including Etruria, is that um, you get the earliest, earliest phases of urbanization, but also you get the emergence of a, a very small, very internationalized elite of basically the super rich. Um, so it's, it's a society completely dominated by, by this sort of small group of very wealthy families uh, who are all in, interconnected by intermarriage and political alliances and all of that. Um, and you can actually trace them through um, in Etruria, you tra can trace them mainly through their burial practices because they bury their dead in absolutely massive tombs with multiple tomb chambers, uh, basically set up as if they were houses uh, and then covered by big earth mounds. Um, and these so-called princely burials include vastly wealthy sets of grave goods, um, hundreds and hundreds of them, including things like banqueting sets of precious metals, fine pottery, gold jewelry, Furniture yeah, chariots, well, you know, they sort of vast think, amounts. Yeah. So they're not they're not by any means it means primitive, uh, but I think perhaps what maybe you know I think that I think they're they're a bit of a magpie civilization. They're taking a lot of influence from other places because a lot of their a lot of the transformation that occurs at this time is that their sort of visual style becomes very sort of orientalized and very influenced by both the Greek Greece and, and Egypt and the Near East. Hmm. And I, I wanted to say that you mentioned pottery, and they really had great pottery work that we still can find today. Yeah. And their description and detail on these potteries is amazing. Yeah. Well, one thing that, I mean, two, two things that the, the Etruscans were particularly known for is their metalwork, which is maybe not surprising because one thing that fueled this economic boom in the seventh century was the, the trade in metal ores. Hmm. Um, uh, one thing that the Greek world was a bit short on was metal and mi mineral ores, uh, but there's a, a ridge of hills in northern Etruria, uh, which is, is very rich in particularly iron ore and copper, uh, and 
we know that ingots of that were being traded all over the Mediterranean. And it's it's that that seems to have really the, the money from that, which is really seems, seems to have, seems to have set off this boom in sort of you know luxury lifestyle for the the Etruscan elite. Um, oh, yeah. No, no, sorry, no. sorry. It's just going to say that the, um, you know, they, they they ended up with this massively rich culture, but um, and some so a lot of in in style, it was taking it's taking its artist, artistic inspiration from, you know, elsewhere from Egypt mm. and from the Near East and from Greece. But at the same time, Etruscan craftsmen were 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 producing in those styles, so they were clearly sort of learning really quickly. It wasn't it wasn't just that they were importing them or. Um, you know, sort of using imported craftsmen. They, so they it was pretty much like any other tropes here at that time. Yeah. Now, we, we talked about Carthage the last time, and I want to ask before we go on, is, was Carthage around at this time, or did they have a good trade with Carthage, the Etruscans? Yeah, they did. They had quite close connections with Carthage, actually. Um, we know that they had um, some sort of uh, various alliances with Carthage. Um, there's a very famous uh, inscription on a, a, a set of three gold tablets from a place called Pyrgi, which is, um, it's actually the port of, of Cairo, the main city of Southern Etruria. And it was found in, uh, in a religious sanctuary in a little sort of treasury underneath the temple. Um, and it's a fascinating document for two reasons. One, one is because it's uh, part of the inscription is in Phoenician, uh, or Punic. Mm. Um, and the rest is in Etruscan, uh, and partly because it seems to suggest that some sort of religious connection or alliance between between, between Carthage and Cairo, because it, it talks about the building of the temple in the sanctuary by a guy called Ther Ther um, Thervarius Velionas, the, the ruler of Cairo, um, but it's partly dedicated to the, the Punic goddess Astarte, as well as the Etruscan goddess Uni. Um, and uh, clearly, there's some sort of connection there between between the two cultures. Um, that sorry, I should have said that that dates to uh, 499 BC. So it's 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 sort of very early fifth century. Um, and we also have, you know, sort of Carthaginians cropping up in Etruscan inscriptions. We've got um, evidence of. Um, Little tokens, which are called tesserae, tesserae hospitales, which are uh, the little, little ivory plaques, um, and the idea is that if you if you if you make a, a sort of formal uh, alliance of sort of reciprocal friendship and hospitality with it, with it, with somebody else from another state, you carry this as a token to prove that you are who you are, and you can claim, you know, you can claim their help and support and hospitality if 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 you if you if you need to. Um, and we have evidence from those that there are alliances between the Etruscan and, and Carthaginian families. Um, so there are there are quite strong connections. And yeah, Carthage is more or less contemporary with this. I think I think the earliest fa the earliest material in, in Carthage is, is ninth century. So it's pretty much same sort of ballpark you know, as the rise of with Carthage than Rome ever had the Etruscans. Um, they didn't it don't seem to me like a warrior kind of tribe. They seem more like a trade. They didn't not, not they didn't focus on what producing warriors like many of the other cultures did. They seem more like yeah. focus on trade. Well, they did they did focus a lot on trade, but they had a fearsome reputation. I mean, like I said, the, the you know the Greek the Greek sources talk about them as bit as bit of being really scary pirates. Yeah, <laughs> I mean the you know the, the I mean the utility says that you know, one of the reasons why Greeks didn't really settle into in some areas of Italy until really, really quite late on is because the Etruscans are there and they're, they're, they're terrifying because they, they come and raid you. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we have, I mean, as far as, far as we can tell, they, their, their armies were a bit like the Roman army, or, well, any other Italian army, it's, it's sort of one, once, once the place had fully urbanized and, and turned into a society of city-states at the end of the second, seventh century, it was really, um, you know, heavy infantry, you know, who were citizen levies. Um, but we know that we know that they did fight, have put up quite a fight against the Romans. I mean, the Romans had quite a lot of difficulty in subduing the Etruscans. Um, and we have images on pots of um, Etruscan troops, sort of apparently um, sort of freezers of, you know, Etrus Etruscans with, with armor and heavy armor and helmets and spears and Big shield, sort of trekking along as a as a group, um, 
so I think I think they, they, they probably were quite a formidable military power. Um, I think maybe one of the reasons why that they didn't really sort of weren't, weren't really able to sort of you know extend their, their military power and, and territorial domination quite like the Romans did was maybe that they didn't have the political organization to do it um, because they the Etruscans were basically organized in a series, in a series of, of independent city states um, and they, they did have a sort of loose sort of religious alliance um, uh, a league which met at a, a religious sanctuary for shared festivals uh, but it really was it did seem to be about religion rather, rather than military cooperation and every now and again you get sort of Roman historians like Vivi saying that you know one, one Etruscan city was under, was under attack and typically from Rome and they'd have gone to appeal to help for, for the rest and you know sometimes they would levy a joint army and turn up and, and all fight as a group and sometimes they wouldn't um, so I think I think they're much more disorganized than Rome in that sense in terms of interstate cooperation and I think maybe that's the difference um, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why we think of Etruscans maybe as mainly trading and, and the Romans as being very much warriors. It's not it's not that the Etruscans couldn't and didn't fight. It was just it was just that they, you know, the Romans were much more systematic about it. Well, you mentioned sort of that the elite had a power in, in the Etruscan world, but did they have some sort of government did they, or did they have a king, monarchy, monarchy absolute monarchy? Or how, how did the, you know, how did they rule? They elite did it was just rule among themselves, the elite traders. What was how did that work out? Um, well, I mean, the, the, this is something that probably, is probably, probably changes quite a lot over, over, over time and also may have been quite regionalized. Um, because when you first get the Etruscans developing as a, as a very distinctive culture in the seventh century, it seems to be dominated by these big aristocrats um, who. You know, we don't know really what their status were. We know, we know, we know, obviously from you know the amount of wealth, and, and also some from some of the visual depictions of them that they were very dominant. Um, uh, but by the time you get into the sixth century, you're getting into 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 a society which is much more a city-state society, um, much more like Greece and Rome. Um, and there we seem to have a, a whole range of uh, conflicting evidence. There are there are some points where. Uh, we find inscriptions that talk about uh, people who seem to be elected magistrates called the Zilat. Um, uh, there are other cases where they talk about somebody who seems to be more, more analogous to a king. Uh, but I think like, like Rome, it's not a hereditary monarchy. It's, um, it's much more of a sort of, you know, whoever's the dominant person in the state rules and then, you know, they're succeeded by sometimes another dominant person, sometimes an elected magistrate. Uh, so it, it, there seems to be quite a quite a lot of a lot of variation. Um, I mean, one thing you can say is that they were they, they, it was a very much a sort of aristocratic, dominated society. Um, you know, with with the the, the, the wealthy elite dominating, uh, but quite how how that translated into actual political power is some is something is something that's quite difficult to pin down. Um, oh, you can, you can kind of do it archaeologically because you can look at visual depictions of people who are obviously power figures and you can pick out things like various symbols of power that, um, I mean, the person in charge is always shown with a sort of curved stick called illiterus. Um, and in the seventh century, um, we've got lots of depictions of We're talking about Etruscan Aristotle. Are you talking about the imagine? We're talking sorry? about seventh century BC and not seventh century AD. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, it's all. Sorry, I should have said it's all. Yeah. It's, it's all. It's I just want to make clear. Yeah. I don't. I don't. Yeah. I don't. I don't really do dates. AD, so sorry. I don't forget. Um, uh, just want to, the, the, I, I just want to make clear for the viewer that in, in case there is yeah. some misunderstanding here. No, no, no. That's fine. No, I should. I should have said. Um, no, but we we have we have um, things like um, there's a, there's a very very fascinating um, villa from uh, uh, being found at a place called Moulin in Siena, uh, which is an absolutely huge complex, and it seems to be the sort of seat of some one of these grand grandest Etruscan lords, uh, which has got a mixture of luxury living quarters and places where sort of craft workshops were carried out, places that seem to be devoted to religious worship. So it's it's not it's more than just a residence. Um, and some of the buildings are, de are decorated with with terracotta reliefs, which actually show 
you know, sort of how, uh, what sort of things that, you know, seventh century aristocrats got up to and what they looked like. Um, and it, it's basically the, the aristocratic lifestyle, you know, banquets, processions, um, military processions, ceremonial processions with people in chariots carrying parasols and so forth. Uh, but they're, they're, all, they're all distinguished very carefully by, by, by their dress. The, the, um, one, of, one of the things that um, you know, seems to be a symbol of power is, 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 is actually um, a, a sort of huge hat that looks like a sombrero. <laughs> um, you know, it's only the sort of, sort of head man who gets to wear the big hat, so it's literally a sort of big hat culture. Um, but that, that's one of the ways. One of the ways you can you can perhaps trace symbols of power. You you know you can look at the iconography. Um, but how that worked in, actually in practice and in translating that into into how these cities were ruled is 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 kind of much more complicated because the the evidence tends to vary quite a lot according to time and place. And um, um, yeah, I was thinking we can move on to the religious part of the Etruscan. They because they, are, they seem to, if I re remember correctly, that they seem to steal. A lot of their religion again from the Greeks and put it into their own. Is that correct? Uh, no, it, they actually have a very distinctive religion. Um, I mean, there's some similarities to Roman religion in that both are highly ritualized, and the the essential thing that you have to do is to discern the will of the gods and then provide provide the the the, the, the right ritual to to you know do whatever the gods want you to do. Uh, but in other ways, it's quite different uh, because Unlike Greek and Roman religion, it seems to be very much revealed religion uh, with quite a strong emphasis on prophecy. Um, I mean, the tradition seems to be that the religious texts and rituals, uh, which were known by the Latin term, the Discoglina Etrusca, uh, were actually handed down by two gods, um, one called Tages and one and, and a nymph called Vigoya. Uh, and then they were, these were written down in several books, which uh, basically gives you a very comprehensive guide to you know, how to organize your society. Um, they had religious books apparently on how to interpret the entrails of sacrificial animals. So, you know, again, it's finding out what the will of the gods is. Um, you've got books on how to interpret lightning and of various other portents. Um, you've got books on how to organize the afterlife and burial and transition to, to, to the afterlife. And there seems to have been a body of knowledge called the Liberi, Liberi Rituales, literally just ritual books, uh, which are actually pretty wide ranging. I mean, it's not just about religion. It tells you, tell, it seems to, it seems to tell, tell them in great detail on how to organize their religious cults, how to organize rituals for, you know, every, every, known, every possible occasion. Yeah. Uh, and also more widely how to organize their, their sort of political and military affairs in their society. So it goes right down to a lot of things that we would really regard, regard as the province of a technical handbook rather than just a religious ritual, like, you know, telling you how to how, how to mark property boundaries or even how to found a city, um, and how, how uh, where to put drainage channels and things like that. Right. So you've got you've got something which is you know on the one hand it's revealed the religion and then on the other hand you've got it goes really right really down into the sort of detail of how you organise your you know, your, the, the life of the community. Did they build several temples for the gods, or did they just have some like a little pit, pit where they sacrificed, or did they have any temples at all? Um, yeah, they did. Um, it, it, temple buildings in in in, in all of ancient societies is, is sort of tends to be a sort of second stage. The, the important thing for the Etruscans was um, a sort of sacred enclosure, which is where you carried out your sacrifices and where the the augur who uh, took the portents, the auspices, could, could, could stand because um, one of the things that they did to try and work out what the gods wanted them to do was sort of stand in this enclosure and watch the bird, watch birds flying around and then try and interpret those. So, you know, kind of if you saw a, an eagle flying from left to right on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the, the north side of the horizon, it would mean one thing. And if it was sort of on the south side and flying the other way, it would mean something else, or if it was a different bird. Um, but they did. They did build temp temples. Um, the place where the Pirgi tablets was found. Uh, yeah, uh, would, can you have an idea of the architecture for the, the temples? Or so on? Yeah, the, the, their architecture was. Um, it, it's different from. It's it's similar to a similar idea to the Greek Greek architecture, but it but it's also quite different in in other important ways. Um, they tended to. 
I mean, whereas Greek temples tended to have a colonnade all the way around, Etruscan ones tended to have just steps and pillars up the front, and um, it, they were decorated with terracotta sculptures rather than stone. Um, but it was very, it, it was very much like the Greek temple that you know you'd have a cult statue of the god. Uh, but sacrifices were always conducted outside the temple, so the, the important thing was actually sort of not not so much the temple itself. Mm. I mean that that was important as a um, a sort of symbol of the importance of the person or the city who built it. Uh, but the important bit for the religion was was actually the sacrifice that took or libation or ceremony that took it took place outside it. Oh, you, you, um, mentioned, you mentioned the prophecy. There had a lot of prophecies, and what well, there is one particular prophecy from the prophet. I'm leaving for the prophet. I don't remember who said this, but there was a prophecy that this they would survive just for live on just for a thousand years, and they apparently did so. Was this an actual prophecy, or was this over 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 exaggerated um, by, by later historians? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a later one. I mean, one of the problems is that most of the evidence that we have for this is what the Roman, author, Roman authors tell us. So that, I think the one that you're talking about, the idea that they, they survived for 10 cycular, um, mm. which is basically regeneration or a century, depending on how you interpret that, uh, comes from a source dating to the third century AD. Um, so that, that's, that's really late. Um, we do have some direct evidence because, um, we have some of the longer inscriptions from, from uh, Etruria uh, have things like lists of ritual calendars um, with lists of deities and, and rituals on them. Um, there's a fifth century BC clay tile from Capio, which has got, got, one of, got part of one of these. Um, and there's also a very fascinating document called the, which is known as the Zagreb mummy, uh, because it's, um, it was part of a document written on a piece of linen um, and what one of the things that the Etruscans seemed to do was to not as well as well as writing on wax tablets or inscribing stuff on sort of stone mm -hmm. or pottery or bronze, they also wrote on uh, books made of linen, which was then you know, rolled up as a scroll or, or folded. Um, and we do we do actually have images of Etruscans reading these um, or holding them folded up uh, on various tomb sarcophagi. Um, uh, but we also have scraps of or parts of uh, of a real one which survived uh, because it had been reusing as used as a wrapping for for a mummy, a mummy which was found in the museum in Zagreb, and it dates. It's quite late. It dates about two fifty BC, uh, and again, it seems to be a, a religious calendar with a list of rituals and sacrifices to be performed at particular times. Uh, so we do have some direct evidence, but of course, the problem is that. Beyond that, you know, we're really reliant on what the Roman authors wanted to record and what they were really interested in is divination. Uh, so, how did the Romans view the Etruscans? Did they view them kind of as barbarians, or did they have a certain amount of respect for the Etruscans? Um, yeah, they they weren't regard they didn't regard them as barbarians because a lot a lot of Etruscan culture, uh, you know, was was very very inter inter integral to to Roman culture. Um, So they certainly didn't regard them as barbarians. I mean, they, they did regard them as competitors, um, uh, but they have um, they have had a lot of respect for Etruscan learning. Um, I mean, one of the things that um, seems to have happened in the sort of sixth through fourth centuries BC is that Etruscan aristocrats uh, were sometimes would sometimes send their children to Etruscan cities like Cairo to be educated. Um, and so they do have this reputation of being a, a sort of area, you know, that's a, a repository of learning. Um, and one of the things that the Romans were very interested in was their, their religious knowledge and their religious law and divination. And I, I think that's one of the reasons why, why so much of our evidence about Etruscan religion sort of focuses on, on divination because the Romans were interested in that and wrote a lot about it. Um, but that that actually goes on quite quite a long time quite quite a long time because um, one of I mean even as late as the sort of end of the Republic or the beginning of the Empire we've got Cicero's friends um, Aulus Caecina who is an Etruscan from Volterra um, who was trained as a Haruspex um, you know one of the people who could interpret entrails um, and um, you know he he's you know they seem to be a, a sort of interest in Etruscan religious 
um, practice even that late. And the Emperor Claudius was a great sort of Etruscophile. I mean, he he allegedly could read Etruscan and, and um, you know, was interested in yeah, yeah, he Etruscan had, history. Didn't he write entire Etruscan history? And then it all got lost. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, one of the things, one of the most intriguing bits that, have, uh, that we know about the connection between the Etruscans and the Romans is that um, there's a, um, Claudius made a big speech to the Senate in uh, as uh, part of his pitch to, to try and get the Senate to admit more people from Gaul uh, as senators. Uh, and what part of that was that he was arguing that we, you know, the Romans had this long tradition of, of welcoming people in and, you know, welcoming Im immigrants and letting them share in power. Um, and he actually says that one of the, the sixth king of Rome, Servius Tullius, uh, was actually an Etruscan. Uh, which is quite, quite eye-watering because he, you know, it, it, everywhere else in the in the Roman tradition, he's a Latin. Uh, but he said, well, he's he was actually a, an Etruscan warlord called Mastana. Um, uh, so he's clearly got hold of a completely separate tradition about some fairly basic bits of Roman history from from an Etruscan source. It's a um, slightly off topic, but I just feel like Claudius is one of the most underrated emperors of ancient Rome who have ruled. In my opinion. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I mean, he was a, he was a smart chap. I mean, I think the idea that he was this sort of bumbling idiot was, mm -hmm. you know, kind of very underrating. Um, but certainly, he, he really liked Etruscans, and he got hold of this whole completely separate tra tradition about you know an important bit of early Roman history. Um, and we all, we know that that was a real tradition because there's a famous tomb from uh, Volci um, at Volci uh, in Etruria called the Francois tomb, uh, which has, uh, as a lot of Etruscan tombs did, frescoes, decorative frescoes inside, um, it's date, dates to the fourth century um, BC. And on one side of it, it's got a, a, a fresco of, taken from the Iliad, the Trojan War. Uh, but on the other side, it's got what appears to be a battle scene between warriors from Volci and warriors from various other places, which includes a Roman called Mastana. <laughs> you know, so the, the idea that, you know, Claudius had just made this up, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's not true. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you know, we've got the evidence right there on a tomb wall. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we talked a little bit about sacrifice and religion, but was there, is there evidence of human sacrifice? I mean, was it just animal sacrifice for religion? Uh, no, it, it, it seems to be just animals. Um, I mean, well, one of the things that we know is that they 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 they, they like sacrificial animals, and then they would go and inspect the liver because one of the fast, really fascinating objects which has survived is a a, a model of a bronze liver from Piacenza in um, you know northeast Italy, uh, which has it was clearly being used for teaching how people to to interpret them because it's got all the various bits sort of demarcated and, and little little abbreviations and names of gods that are associated with particular areas of the liver. But it, it does just seem to have been animal sacrifice. Um, the other thing that they they did was, um, as I said, they were, they were very interested in, look, in observing the heavens and watching birds flying around and drawing conclusions from that. And also things like lightning and thunderbolts. Um, you know, if there was a storm, you would conclude all sorts of things uh, from it. Um, I mean, one thing we don't know, because you asked about, about gods uh, briefly, uh, one thing we don't know is whether they had any sort of cosmology or mythology. Um, I mean, some people think they did, uh, but the evidence is quite limited, and maybe that's one of the big differences with Greek religion. Um, because what they seem to have started out as is with a series of not particularly anthropomorphized gods uh, who were really gods of nature. Um, and then later on, they, they they adopted, they seem to have adopted Greek deities uh, and myths because we find, we find um, quite a lot in Etruscan art, which are sort of variations on Greek gods and, and mythologies. Um, and sometimes you get an overlap between the two as you do with Greek, Greek, Greek and Roman religion. Um, uh, so by, by the time you get to the sixth century, we seem to have a, a about 38 deities that we know of, some of which are really, really archaic and seem to be not, not really sort of particularly human. They're more sort of spirits of nature. Um, and others are people like um, 
you know, Apollo and Hercules that have been adopted from the Greek world and given Etruscan names. Um, uh, and as I said earlier on, it's, um, you know, there's a certain amount of convergence because we have this sanctuary uh, in the territory of Cairo where both Punic Astarte and, and Egypt, uh, Etruscan Uni uh, were worshipped along with uh, Apollo who come from Greece mm. as a god. Um, and further up the coast, you have a place called Gravisca, which is a port of another city, Tarquinia. Uh, which has a whole series of Greek votives offer, offered to Apollo, De Demeter and Hera, alongside a whole load of Etruscan ones offered to a whole range of Etruscan gods, including um, uh, Turan and Uni, who's a sort of Hera equivalent. Um, so it does seem to be a sort of very sort of dynamic religion in the sense that the, on the one hand, you've got these sort of very rigid sacred texts and, and rituals you have to observe, but at the same time, it seems to be quite open to other religions. Now, something I want to talk about, which I kind of find it would be fascinating, what was a woman, woman's role in the Etruscan world? Because they, what, from what I remember, it seems like they were more free than the, a Greek woman or a Roman woman. Yeah, they, they were, the role of women in Etruscan society is fascinating because, uh, yeah, they did seem to have a much higher profile than in most ancient societies. And I, um, think, I believe this was looked down upon from the Romans and the Greeks, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I mean, well, one thing we one thing we know about, I mean, we have we have quite a lot of comment by Greek authors about this. Um, there's a guy called Theopompus who wrote in the, the fourth century BC, um, who was absolutely scandalized by Etruscan women. I mean, there's a long passage quoted by another author uh, in which, you know, Theopompus is practically tearing his hair out about these terrible, immoral Etruscan mm -hmm. women because they, you know, they do shocking things like attending imagine banquets. Imagine having, imagine having a free woman. Yes, I know, yes. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, the, the, the charge sheet against them included things like attending yeah. banquets along with their husbands and reclining at tables with men and being able to propose toasts and going out and about in public. Horrible, and, absolutely horrible. Absolutely, even exercising in public. But the, the interesting thing about this is the kind of spin that, that Theopompus puts on it because he sort of says, well, these are terribly moral women, mm. shocking, you know, and they, they're obviously living a really dissolute lifestyle. Mm. And if you look at, the sort of material evidence from Etruria itself, um, you can kind of see where it comes, where, where, where some of it comes from, because yes, you know, tomb paintings do show women banqueting and dancing in public and low, low, you know, lying on banqueting couches aside their menfolk, uh, but they weren't immoral. I mean, they were just, you know, these were extremely wealthy ladies, you know, in their, their, their posh frocks and all their jewelry attending banquets in, in a very formal setting. Um, so, you know, I think the interesting thing there is that, you know, you've got, you've got a real culture clash that on the one hand, you've got, you know, Etruscan women who seem to have had quite a lot of freedom and a lot less of seclusion than there was the case in, in at least some parts of the Greek world. And on the other hand, you've got this Greek bloke who says, oh dear, this is terrible. Um, but, you know, as I say, if you look at the context, you know, the, these are clearly not sort of, you know, loose women or dancing girls, you know, you know these are respectable ladies of considerable yeah. status who are, you know, sort of just accompanying their husbands on a social occasion. Did um, the Russian men view women as kind of equals at this point part or did they view them as um, property or how did they view them? Well, it, 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 it's, a, it's a bit more difficult to tell that because we don't really have that sort of insight into it from, from actually within the society. You know, what of the, I mean, the problem is that what we've got, a lot of what we've got about Etruscan women is, is, is sort of observations from, from people outside Etruria who, you know, aren't necessarily mm. looking at this uh, in a, with a friendly eye. Um, but I think that, I mean, there are two ways into this. Um, one is looking at inscriptions, uh, because so, quite a lot of the, the very early inscriptions are dedicated either to or by women. Uh, so they seem to have had quite a visible role in their community. Um, and uh, the other thing, which, which is, I mean, it sounds very, very abstruse and technical, but it's quite revealing, is that if you look at how Etruscan names are structured, um, most ancient names just give a patronymic, an indication of your father's name as part of your name. Mm. Whereas in Etruria, they give both the father's name and the mother's name. Uh, so clearly, who your mother was was just as important as who your who you, who your father was as, as as part of your social identity, mm -hmm. and I think that's 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 actually very unusual. I mean, you certainly don't get that in Rome, for instance, as well as Greece. 
Um, so that, that sort of level of visibility and importance of, you know, the mother's identity and family as, as well as the father's is, is, quite, is quite revealing. Um, and the, there's a possibility that they may have been able to own property, um, which again is uh, a bit debatable because it relies on how you interpret a long inscription from Cortona, which dates to the third century BC. Um, and as far as we can tell, uh, and that's got to be heavily qualified because the Etruscan language isn't well understood, it seems to have been a, an inscription which dealt with an, an issue of uh, land ownership. Um, but the interesting thing there, here, there is that um, the principal person mentioned as part of this, uh, whatever this dispute or land ownership uh, sale was, was a guy called Petrus Gevas. Uh, but also the other person who's mentioned as one of the principals in this is his wife. Uh, so there's a suggestion that maybe Petrus gave us his wife, whose name, shamefully, I can't actually remember off the top of my head, uh, was, was also a, a joint owner of this property. Um, and that, that's interesting because in other Italian societies in ancient Italy, um, and even in Rome, uh, women, you know, are much more legally subscribed. Um, Oh, sorry, circumscribed. Uh, so it's, it's it's difficult to say without because we don't know really anything much about about Etruscan law. But just the the, the indications that we've got, both you know the hostile comment from from Greek authors and and also what we can pick up from you know the Etruscans' own inscribed documents, uh, do seem to suggest that women had quite a lot of status uh, and also may have had you know legal rights like property ownership. Um, but as I say, it's influence as well, like Russian Roman women do, like we, you know, and Gorfina was the mother of Nero, had huge influence in Roman society, or you know, like many women in the Roman history have had huge influence. Did she had did, like, did they have kind of the same influence here, or like, I think they probably did because that that's characteristic of a lot of uh, aristocratic societies. Uh, you know, the women, women don't have influence per se, but women from elite families do because not not because they're women, because of because of the status of their family. Uh, so it would that that wouldn't really be unsurprising, and I think they probably did. I mean, the I mean, unfortunately, the the only example I can think of to kind of flesh that one out actually comes from early Roman history. Um, I think I, I mentioned earlier on Demaratus of Corinth moving to to to, to Tarquinia, you know, and setting up there. Um, his, his son, uh, who was uh, named in the in the sources as, as Lucomo, um, actually migrates to Rome uh, and becomes ultimately Luc uh, Tarquinius Priscus, the, the fifth king of Rome. And a lot of the sources give for the, for that episode give quite a high profile to his wife, Tanaquil, um, that um, it's said that Tanaquil is the person who persuades Lukumo to make this move, and she's the person who sort of helps to sort of promote him to the point where he becomes the right-hand man of the fourth king, um, and then then ultimately succeeds him. Um, and also, after after uh, Tarquinius Priscus dies, she's supposed to be the person who who then negotiates the the, the transition to his successor. Um, so that's interesting for two reasons. I mean, for, firstly, because of, of what it says about the influence that, that aristocratic women could have in this sort of society, um, not not just in, in Etrurian, but also in Rome. Um, uh, but also it gives some indication of the sort of close, sort of political and cultural links between Rome and Etruria at this stage, which is, sorry, I should, I should have said that's middle of the sixth century BC. Yeah. Um, again, why, why did the Romans take over Italy and not the Etruscans? Were they as focused on empire-based? Were, were they mostly impact, focused on trade and merchants? Mm -hmm. Russian theater or yeah. what, what, what happened and what happened to them eventually? Did they um, or did they just become Romanized? Yeah, I think the, I mean, the, the answer to the sort of why, you know, why, why, did, why did Rome become the dominant power rather than somewhere like Tarquinia or Cairo is, I think, to do with the way the Romans organized themselves. Um, 
because um, I mean, the Etruscans were a, a society of independent city-states. Um, they, they had a sort of overarching religious body, a, a religious league, which met at a place called Lucas Feroniae, just outside what's now Orvieto. Um, and they do seem to have had some sort of element of military cooperation um, based on, on membership of that league. Uh, but it wasn't very systematic. Um, and I think Rome, Rome basically played divide and rule uh, because what Rome did, which was really quite clever, is that um, in the fourth century, they um, developed a policy of, um, when they conquered um, a state, they didn't sort of just sort of absorb it or force it to become Roman citizens. Um, they made an alliance with it. And the condition of that alliance was that they, you have to have the same friends and enemies as Rome. And also if Rome will protect you. Uh, but if Rome wants to, it can ask for you to send some troops to its army. Um, and that's, that's quite a neat, a neat trick because on the one hand, it means that, um, you know, instead of having a, a pool of sort of conquered and resentful people that the Romans are having to con having to control, it has a, a pool of allies that, that it cooperates with, uh, but also it's able to to help itself to the military power of those allies on on request, um, and that means that Rome has you know vast reserves of manpower that it can it can lay hands on where as and when it needs to, um, and a load of, a, a very a very big network of allies that it that, that are bound to to sort of support it. And I think that Rome had actually, in a way, sort of cracked the difficulty of how a state with the sort of just the, the sort of fairly rudimentary administrative apparatus of, of, of an ancient city state could, could actually rule quite a big area of territory. Um, and, and the Etruscans never did. I mean, they, they just remember, remained sort of a fragmented set of city states. Um, so I think, I think maybe that's the difference. I don't, I don't think it was to do with um, military power because. Um, I mean, the Rome Romans started trying to subdue Etruria Itru in the sixth century BC, and they were still they were they were still at it in the middle of the third century. I mean, it took it took it they took a fair amount of conquering. Um, uh, so I don't think it was that the Etruscans were military weak, militarily weak. I think it was that they they didn't have a a, a way of a form of interstate cooperation in the, in the way that the Romans did. And I think um, it's worth mentioning too that Tuscany, the area the area around Rome is named after the Etruscans. Yeah, it is. The, the fascinating thing is that the, being Etruscan is still a huge part of regional identity in modern Tuscany. Um, I mean, I've heard sort of friends and colleagues in, 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 in who are from that part of the world refer to themselves as sort of noi Etruski, you know, we, we Etruscans do things such and such or, you know, things such and such. So it's, it's, still, it's still a huge part of their, their, their sort of civic identity, of their, their cultural identity. Now, if, if there's any listeners out there who want to go to Italy when you can travel again, and is there any places where you can see the Etruscan sites or what it may have looked like outside Italy? Or in Tuscany? Yeah, um, I mean, anyone who's visiting, I mean, the, the, the whole region's got masses of museums, which with a lot, a lot of these artifacts in. Um, I mean, one of the sites which is really fascinating to, to, to wander around is, is, uh, Chive it is uh, the, the remains of ancient Cairo, what's now Civetri, um, because you can want you, the um, the sort of burial area outside the city walls is still there and you've got you can see lots of examples of these big tumulus burials with with tomb chambers inside um, and also some smaller ones which are set up almost like sort of terraced houses along the street so there's a, there's a sort of city of the dead there that you can have a wander around um, and the same at Tarquinia um, and um, those are the tombs that are painted so um, the ones at uh, Chivetri aren't they tend to be decorated with carved in, 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 sort of inter interiors of tomb chambers car carved with um, sort of tomb couches and, and furniture and you know sort of depictions of daily objects on the walls and things so they look like houses uh, but the ones in Tarquinia are the ones with the frescoes and they're, they're absolutely magnificent they, they are wonderful um, I mean uh, elsewhere I think the um, you know there are there are other places where you can you can see the physical remains but the the museums are you know really superb um, lots of lots of fascinating 
um, you know, museums you can go and see. Um, the other thing is that if anyone's interested in this, um, the two places to make for in Ro there are two places to make for in Rome, uh, one of which is the Villa Giulia Museum, uh, which is dedicated to the Etruscans, um, and the other is the Etruscan section of the Vatican Museums, uh, which has got a, an absolutely fascinating collection um, if it's open. Um, I have to, have, to, have to say that infuriating, you often have to get a permit to get to get a special permit to get into parts of that. But um, um, you know, if that's open, then it's it's well worth a look. Thank you so much for coming back. You're always welcome to this podcast. Do you have anything you wish to promote? Any social media or where people can find you if they have any questions on this topic or the previous previous episode you were on about Hannibal? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not really that 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 much on social media, I'm afraid. But uh, mm. um, but I mean, if um, I mean, I, I don't I don't I don't actually have, I don't actually really have any social media accounts, unfortunately. So, or not not that are active at the moment. But I, I will let you know if I if I get round round to reactivating any any of my, any of my social media. Something I'm I'm meaning to do, but haven't haven't got round to yet. Um, but um, yeah, they're a they're a fascinating people. So um, you know, it's really pleased to have a chance a chance to have a talk about them. Absolutely. And before we go, I don't really say this much, but if you're here just to listen to Catherine, that's great. That's fantastic. But I would urge, I would recommend you to like, subscribe, and share this podcast because we can use more subscribers. And if you're listening to YouTube, please subscribe. Most of my listeners are fortunate to not subscribe on my YouTube channel. So please do that. Make sure to do that if you want to stay tuned for the next episode and upcoming episodes. We have some really interesting topics to cover. And check out some of the, of the previous episodes. They are really fascinating. You can check out Catherine's episode on Hannibal, which is really good. And my name is Alan. And this has been World H12. We are available on social media and on Instagram and World H12. My personal Instagram is Alan Hedrock if you want to follow me there. Um, yeah, we are available on Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, wherever you can find podcasts. And I'm, I'll see you next week. We will take a look at Pirates. So thank you for, so much for coming, and I'll see you next time.